So, it's been nearly 20 years since the release of Jared Hess's breakout debut comedy, Napoleon Dynamite. Napoleon Dynamite? Napoleon? 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 Napoleon. Napoleon. Your name is Napoleon? Yes. On paper, this is a movie about a dorky high school kid in a rural Idaho town who helps his best friend run for class president while looking for love and dealing with his creepy uncle. Hey, you guys want to see my video? But if I believed that's all this movie was, I'd be talking about something else. But here we are. Freaking idiot! Now, this is a movie that most everybody has either seen or at the very least is familiar with. And while I agree that not every movie has to be some deep and robust metaphor for life or the human condition, I do think that there is an interesting angle for Napoleon Dynamite that hasn't necessarily been explored yet. At least, not by me. Let me explain. Napoleon Dynamite was co-written and directed by Jared Hess, who co-created the character with John Hedder and Jerusa Hess. At the time, they were just college kids who created the character of Napoleon, although his name was originally Seth, as the subject of a short film for a class project. It wasn't until the short, titled Palooka, was a success at Sundance Film Festival that Jared was convinced to drop out of school and develop a feature-length film based on his character. Now, Hess had never made a feature production before, and let alone dealt with studios and executives in Hollywood, although he was able to secure a very modest $400,000 budget and a casting crew of his friends to help with the shoot. I got a little project that we might be able to make a little moolah with. Really? While developing the script, Jared and his wife Jerusha included a large chunk of their own real experiences and characteristics and have even stated that the movie is, quote, so autobiographical. So, with that being said, let me just ask you this. If you dropped out of school to make your first movie and you had $400,000 of someone else's money to tell your autobiographical story, would you make it a story about nothing? At the moment, nothing comes to mind. Probably not. So, join me in today's episode where I watch this film for the millionth time in 20 years and try to determine once and for all, what is Napoleon Dynamite really about? In order for us to figure out what this movie is, we first have to understand what it isn't. Now, I grew up with this movie much like many people, and it has become a sort of comforting and cozy movie for me that I revisit whenever I'm feeling nostalgic. And I'm well aware that trying to force deeper meaning on a feel-good teen comedy can kind of ruin the mood. So I'm not going to be treating this movie as if it's some heady, metaphorical, art house drama. I mean, after all, we're talking about a movie that has Dietrich Bader playing a cranky Taekwondo instructor called Rex. Bow to your sensei. Bow to your sensei! However, I am going to break down some of the aspects of the movie that I think Jared Hess may have used to deepen the plot of the film, and maybe even learn a little something about himself in the process. And I believe that the way a movie opens can tell us a lot about what the story is trying to say. Napoleon Dynamite is an awkward kid. The film opens with him waiting for the bus to school and we're given a lot of information in this opening scene. Napoleon's wardrobe and even the house behind him would almost make you think that we're in the 80s, but we're not. It takes place in 2004, when the movie was made, and this shows us that the town our story is set in is slightly behind the times. We'll see more of this throughout the film, with Napoleon using a Betamax machine, a Walkman, a cord telephone, and who could forget my man's moon boots. This is important to the overall style and aesthetic of the film, but it also tells us that the wacky characters in this movie are maybe not living in the now, so to speak. She's jealous. Says I'm living too much in 82. When Napoleon gets on the bus, we notice that he's not only the oldest kid there, but he's also the only one on the bus that isn't a child. 
The first time I saw this movie, I remember laughing my ass off when Napoleon tosses an action figure with a fishing line around it out the window of the bus and just sits there holding it while he drags it across the ground. Maybe this is just a hilarious gag to set the tone of the film, or maybe it's a device to tell us that Napoleon, much like his town and his He-Man action figure, are a little bit behind in life. Uh, Napoleon is this, you know, he's a high school kid who's just a total social outcast. He's completely clueless to what he's really all about. He doesn't know how dorky he is. He's, he's a big dork, a nerd, but he lives in his own world. He, he lives by his own rules and he's trying to make friends and survive high school. And, you know, he's like, everybody thinks he, he thinks everybody's against, and the whole world is against him. So he's always on the defense. He's always trying to defend himself. And but Napoleon is all about getting skills. He wants to, you know, it's you, you're no one if you have if you don't have nunchuck skills. If you don't know how to draw, you're no one. Um, so he is just he's kind of doing his own thing. This extends through scenes that establish how much of a loner Napoleon is. He doesn't seem to have any friends at all, in fact, and it may seem at first like he doesn't want friends, as he doesn't exactly like his classmates either, but I think Napoleon does want friends, or at least he wants people to think he's cool. Napoleon, like many of the kids we knew growing up, lies about the strangest and most unbelievable things, and he does not care. You know, there's like a buttload of gangs at this school. This one gang kept wanting me to join because I'm pretty good with a bow staff. Now, we've all done some version of this. And why do we do it? Because we want to be seen as what we think is cool. And we want to see ourselves as what we think is cool. Napoleon, don't be jealous that I've been chatting online with babes all day. With any movie, it's important to establish a character and the thing that they want to achieve by the end of the movie. And Napoleon doesn't want to rob a casino or get booze for a party. He just wants to have some friends in his life. And he's not looking to be the most popular kid in school or be some different, cooler version of himself. He's more or less just a kid with a below average social status looking to catch up to the pack and exist comfortably somewhere in the middle. He wants to have a friend to collaborate with, to lean on, and to have his back. Rex Quando, we use the buddy system. No more flying solo. You need somebody watching your back at all times! It's safe to say that Napoleon just wants the typical high school experience, but he doesn't want to have to change who he is in order to get it. And we're going to talk more about that later. Let's look at some of the movie's other aspects and see if we can extract something that can help us put this whole thing in focus. What happens in the movie? A dorky high school kid wants friends but doesn't have any, and he meets an exchange student who kind of has no choice but to hang out with him, so they become pals. Napoleon lives with his wacky grandma and equally awkward brother, Kip. When grandma goes on an ATV trip to the sand dunes and gets injured, Broke her Napoleon's uncle Rico comes to house it while she recovers, and his arrival turns Napoleon's world upside down. That is a basic summary of what we're in for, which brings me to the next character that I want to break down, the villain of the piece, and maybe my favorite character to cringe at, Uncle Rico. Back in 82, I used to be able to throw a pigskin a quarter mile. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. So, it's not until Napoleon's Uncle Rico gets to town that Napoleon experiences some of the worst moments of his life, but also some of the best. Uncle Rico is a sort of snake oil, door-to-door -door salesman type who looks like he should be selling used cars in 70s Miami. Rico is not cool, and deep down, he knows he's not cool. How much you want to make a bet I can throw a football over the mountains? He lies, cheats, steals, and doesn't seem to care about anybody but himself. But in a lot of ways, he's exactly like Napoleon. They both want their ideal life, and they both want things to become better without having to change anything about themselves to get there. The difference is that Napoleon cares about his friends and the effect that Rico's antics have on their lives. She pretty much hates me by now. Why? Go, Rico's an idiot! Now, there are all kinds of bully-type antagonists in this movie, but the only real bad guy here is Rico, so let's see why Napoleon hates him so much. 
Rico embarrasses Napoleon, but it all seems deeper than that. I think Napoleon sees Rico as a self-serving kind of infection spreading to his family and his outside life. When Rico comes to town, he immediately recruits Kip to help him with his latest hustle and attaches himself to people in Napoleon's life. He's cold, he's creepy, insensitive, cringe, and worst of all, he's got two things that Napoleon wants. A job and confidence. So we still feeling pretty good about this 32-piece uh, set here? Rico is kind of a swindler. He pretends to be something that he's not in order to seem cool. I mean, we gotta look legit, man. So by serving as a foil to our hero in that way, Napoleon is able to learn that while his uncle might suck, he may also be onto something with being more bold and taking more risks. And that's when Napoleon decides to level up and ask a girl to the dance. Girls only want boyfriends who have great skills. Aren't you pretty good at drawing, like, animals and warriors and stuff? So I was telling, um, Joe Blow. Joe Blow. Yeah. 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 Well, I, was, I know. I was telling Jared before that the first time I saw this movie was 20 years ago in a movie theater in Montreal. And the first time I realized this was going to be a big deal was a guy came in wearing a Vote for Pedro shirt. Do you ever get sick of seeing Vote for Pedro shirts? Uh, no. I mean, it's... As I say, because they love you. You never you never want to play the villain of a movie, all right, that's, that's hated. Because then, then people will, you know, snicker and stare at you, right? But because Pedro is so resounding with at least with hope and he has integrity, yeah, you know, everywhere I go around the world, people want to embrace Pedro. And I'm like, I'm just very fortunate to be a part of a project where, where it's about inclusion, it's about diversity, it's about telling your stories, you know, of friendship, of family, and, and, and the independent filmmaking, right? It's hard making a movie already. So to tell a great story, you got to find the, the, the so just some of the, the, the basic uh, uh, details that really shape the story. Jared was able to how the heck are you going to do that? Build a cake or something. Napoleon Dynamite is a lot of things, but the movie and the character are never fake. Meaning they're never putting on a prettier face to tell us something or make an impression. But that doesn't mean that we can't love it for exactly what it is. And at the end of the day, through Napoleon's struggle to make friends, then his struggles to keep those friends while his uncle ruins everybody's lives and eats all their steak, too bad, she says she doesn't want you here when she gets back because you've been ruining everybody's lives and eating all our steak. To eventually realizing that the true meaning of the story and the key to being happy in your own awkward and never perfect life is just to keep being yourself and let the people that accept you find you. And eventually, even in the smallest of towns and even with the strangest of people, everybody can make a friend. So me and you are pretty much friends by now, right? Yes. Watching this movie as an adult, I think I see the character of Napoleon in a more earnest and self-aware kind of way. When I was 12 and laughing my head off at the sight of Napoleon dancing to Jamiroquai's Canned Heat, or nearly pissing myself every time I saw that horrific drawing of Trisha, I still see those scenes as funny. But now I also see them as reassuring. Pedro, just listen to your heart. That's what I do. These incredibly hard to watch scenes of awkward connections and dry moments between even drier characters lets me see that what Jared Hess wanted to spend $400,000 and a summer of intense heat and shooting schedules to tell us is that it's okay to embarrass yourself. And it's okay to be embarrassed. In fact, it's better that way. Because when it all comes down to it, we all just want to find our own slice of life. And we all want our friends, no matter how few or how many, to be real and genuine friends. And maybe what Jared Hess wants us to know is that the best way to find those friends is to be real and genuine yourself. Listen to the song that they chose to open the movie with. I can tell that we are gonna be friends. Or how about the fact that the opening shot is Napoleon standing alone outside of his house, and the closing shot is him playing tetherball with Deb. Napoleon Dynamite is about friendship. 
Let's take a quick look at some of Napoleon Dynamite's scenes that best illustrate my point. In the scene where Napoleon lies to his classmates about how he spent his summer, he says this. What'd you do on last summer again? I told you, I spent it with my uncle in Alaska hunting wolverines. That scene is immediately followed by Napoleon being put in a headlock and beat up, almost like punishment for not being himself. The scene where Napoleon lies about having a model for a girlfriend is followed by Rico showing up and essentially sabotaging Napoleon's only chance at getting a real girlfriend. Or how about the scene where Rico tries to sell fake herbal enhancers to Starla and just blatantly gets his ass kicked? Jeez. Whenever someone in the film is being fake or not their authentic self, it seems like the character is immediately being punished shortly after. And on the reverse of that, when a character does something wholeheartedly authentic and earnest, it usually works out pretty well. For example, let's look at the film's ending. Kip finally meets LaFonda and the two fall madly in love and Kip finds his true self. Pedro becomes class president, Rico of course goes back to slumming it in his van, and Deb and Napoleon play a game of tetherball which is meant to come full circle from the initial scenes of Napoleon playing by himself. Pedro was authentically himself and never tried to impress anyone. Happy ending for him. Kip was literally way too stoked on becoming a cage fighter to be fake in the slightest. Happy ending for him as well. Deb was authentically herself, but secretly lonely and in need of friendship which she finds in Napoleon and Pedro. And with Rico being a greasy dirtbag, he kind of just goes back to his hole and actually maybe finds love? I, I don't know. I've actually always been kind of confused by this. You know, soaking it up in a hot tub with my soul, mate. Now, like I said, I know this isn't groundbreaking information, and I know that Napoleon Dynamite is a wonderfully simple and quirky film that makes us all laugh, but I also think that why it stands the test of time and why it has made such a huge impact all these years later is because no matter who you are or how far you get away from your teenage years, you should always be yourself. And that, my friends, is what Napoleon Dynamite is really about. Well, I could have told you that. <laughs> wow. Happy 20 year anniversary to the cast and crew involved in the making of Napoleon Dynamite, a true cult classic film. Thank you so much for 20 years of wholesome encouragement. Peace out.